Welcome to the Young Turks. I am your host, Jake Uger. We've got a great show ahead for you guys. What are we doing on today's show? The ACLU has a new report on uh, Barack Obama's civil liberties record. Is it good? Is it bad? I'll give you a hint. It's bad. <laughs> Okay, we'll give you the details a little bit later in the show. The Koch, uh, Koch brothers <laughs> have been caught red-handed. Uh, we will discuss that. We've got tape of them talking to their very, very rich uh, friends about how they're going to influence the elections. We've got a lot of news on that a little bit later in the program. Romney has a new jobs plan, which you're going to be shocked to find out helps the rich. I'm going to explain how. More goofiness from Rick Perry and why the rest of the right wing has turned on Sarah Palin. All that fun stuff coming up in just a little bit. Now, uh, let's get started with President Obama's speech tomorrow night. Now, everybody's talking about this because this is the big jobs proposal. It's going to be great. Now, are you ready for what's in it? I hope you're sitting down. Turns out, more tax cuts. I didn't see that coming. Golly gee willikers. <laughs> okay. And different kinds of tax cuts. Before, for example, they were in favor of the payroll tax cut for workers. Now they're thinking they might also be in favor of a payroll tax cut for the employers. Businesses getting a break under the Obama administration? I didn't see that coming. Wow, okay, that is a bold new proposal. Because tax cuts have worked so well over the last 10 years, let's, why not give it a go again? You know how much jobs we've created over the last 10 years as we've cut taxes over and over again? We've lost one million jobs. Yeah, let's go down that road again. So now, uh, among his other proposals, apparently, when you combine the one-year extension of the payroll tax cut uh, along with unemployment benefits, and now look, that obviously helps the unemployed and uh, stimulates the economy as well. So be, to be fair, uh, both of that put together is $170 billion. That's the lion's share of uh, what he's going to propose. In fact, the overall tax cuts and some Small spending measures will combine for $300 billion package overall, apparently, in the speech that he's going to present tomorrow night. Uh, he is going to apparently also give a tax credit for businesses, again, I didn't see that coming, for hiring the unemployed. Look, if you're going to give them a credit for anything, I suppose that's a good place to start. So again, it's mixed. It's a tax cut. I don't think it's the right way to go. At least it's going somewhat in the right direction, though. That'll cost $30 billion. Uh, One-year tax break uh, for depreciation of business assets. That's just another Republican idea, completely adopted. We've tried that a million times. That's why companies right now, the Fortune 500 companies, are sitting on $1.9 trillion in cash. It's not like they don't have the money. So they're going to take those tax cuts, and they're going to just say, oh, thank you very much. Now I have more money in-house. In but they're not spending the money to create jobs. That's why all of uh, Almost all of these tax cuts, including the depreciation one that I just mentioned, are almost totally useless. They do not actually create jobs. This is not a jobs proposal. This is how can we get the businesses to get even richer proposal. So of course, uh, shockingly enough, the Republicans have come out and said, hey, you know what? We're, we will actually agree to a lot of these proposals. Look at that. We're going to have bipartisanship. Now, why are the Republicans saying that when normally they say, no, no matter how much it was their idea in the first place? because they saw the polls. You know what congressional approval rating is down to? 12%. That's a record, all-time record. People hate Congress. Now look, Obama isn't doing great himself. Uh, in fact, uh, the, one of the articles described it in the Associated Press as a remarkable downturn in his polling numbers. It wasn't remarkable to us, because we've been telling you it's going to happen for months now. It happened exactly as we were told you it was going to happen, because they're not creating jobs. Obama isn't. Certainly, Congress isn't. So now, they both decided, hey, you know what? This whole fighting thing isn't working out. Let's agree on some principles. Now, you think the Republicans, when they say that, mean actual bipartisanship? <laughs> of course not. So here's what the Republicans have agreed to. Uh, Long uh, stalled trade agreements, but wait a minute, but that's a Republican idea. 100% a Republican idea. Free trade deals with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. Panama is the one that gets me, because we're going to get almost no benefit from that. It's just a giant tax haven for the rich and for corporations. Uh, they also have agreed to reducing regulation. Well, are they not merciful? 
which apparently Obama is going to propose even more reduced regulations, right? So less protections for us, more benefits for business. And shockingly, the Republicans have agreed to it. And then finally, they're also going to uh, agree to fund some infrastructure projects. Now, that sounds good, right? Well, first of all, that helps businesses because the money goes straight to the business. But look, I'll take it. That's a fair enough compromise because at least people get hired and at least we build infrastructure. Now. You think that that's it? No, of course not. The Republicans say we will fund infrastructure projects, except we will have no new funding for any of those projects. Okay, wait a minute, what does that mean? I don't understand what that means. So that means we're not gonna give you a damn thing. If it's already in the pipeline and we already agreed to it and some businesses get rich off it, fine, you can continue those programs. But new projects, we're not gonna do no stinking new projects. That might create jobs and help Obama get reelected. We're not in favor of that. So our idea of bipartisanship is we will agree to all of our ideas. And you think President Obama's gonna take that deal? Oh, you better believe it. Bet your bottom dollar on it. So he will propose things that are already at least two-thirds Republican and two-thirds tax cuts and one-third, you know, somewhat progressive ideas. That one-third will immediately get thrown in the garbage and they will agree to the two-thirds that are purely Republican ideas. Set it in stone. That's what's going to happen. So you don't even need to watch the speech tomorrow. Just get your chips and dips ready for the football game. That's all. Okay, so uh, if you want, I can give you more details. Well, I think that'll do it. Okay, so now, where has that led us to? Or I should frame it this way, right? Okay, so that's uh, what's going to happen tomorrow night. Well, do the American people agree with these idea of tax cuts, and that's the only thing we can agree to in terms of creating jobs? Uh, how do they b believe we should balance the budget? It said, well, it's a good thing there's a poll out, Politico George Washington University. Uh, first of all, uh, when asked, do you favor a large-scale, federally subsidized, nationwide construction program? Now, that's what I've been proposing all along, right? Remember, I said, let's government, spend money, actually hire people yourselves. Look at the numbers, 51% favor, only 21% opposed. But I'm a crazy lib. Uh, of course the White House can't listen to me. I, I'm, I'm a wild-eyed progressive that only a, a majority of the country agrees with and almost no one disagrees with. 21%. You got a bunch of Tea Party here saying, no, let's not do any investment, right? So apparently that's the right strategy. Will that get through? Probably not. Now, when you look at the super committee in a different poll now, NBC Wall Street Journal poll, and they ask him, hey, um, how should the super committee balance our budget? Well, 60% say that it would be acceptable if the super committee comes up with a plan to reduce the deficit by ending the Bush tax cuts. Well, that's exactly what we want, right? So again, the country, significantly, clearly progressive. Well, uh, how about a combination of tax increases and spending cuts? Well, they're like, okay, if you have to do spending cuts, I guess we can live with it. We'd just rather do the tax increases on the rich, but okay, 56%, that's still a good number. Now, how about if the super committee only reduced the deficit by cutting spending? Now, that's what the Republicans have pushed for and what the Democrats have agreed to so far. Well, that's totally unpopular. That's a 37%. People are not interested in that. But of course, that's the direction Washington is going. Well, how about the idea that the Republicans proposed and apparently Obama agreed to uh, earlier on in the process when they were looking for a grand bargain? It has not happened yet, but it might happen in the super committee, which is the idea of cutting Medicare in order to balance the budget. You ready? Only 20% believe that we should do it that way. So how clear do they have to be? Do not cut Medicare, okay? But nonetheless, uh, right now the Democrats are negotiating with the Republicans on whether they should cut Medicare. How bad do you need the poll numbers to be? Only 20% of the country want that. Well, they, of course, it's not about that. It's not about the voters. It's about the people who fund their campaigns. Now, on a somewhat related note, let me just uh, give you two more things on, uh, uh, on Obama's proposals. Then we're going to move on to Rick Perry's proposals. And if you thought Obama's proposals were mediocre, wait till you get a load of Romney, okay? So now, um, and we got stuff on Perry coming up as well. So, uh, first of all, a really interesting uh, study comparing 54 nations. Uh, one of the lead researchers was University of Virginia professor uh, Shigehiro Oishi. 
Uh, there's no way that I said that right, but I gave it my best shot. Uh, and uh, what they did was they actually looked at a ton of people, over 59,000 people surveyed uh, by Gallup organization originally in 2007, to figure out what made countries happier. So they look at the overall, a great number of factors that go into quote unquote happiness, they have a metric for it, uh, and which countries are happier and what's the most determinative factor. Now it doesn't mean that it necessarily caused it, but the one that is most highly correlated. Very interesting, you ready for it? A progressive tax system. So the more the tax system was progressive, meaning you charge higher percentage taxes as people get richer and richer, the happier the country was. You know why? Because it created income equality. We've talked about this before. I've shown you many studies on it. The number one determining factor of a country that is unhappy and has a great number of social ills is income inequality. Now, but there was an interesting twist on this. People are not happier if the government spends more. Now, theoretically, we're supposed to be libs, and we want the government, in the conservative caricature of us, to spend as much as possible. But that doesn't get the job done. So for example, the United States spends a ton of money on health care, but we have terrible results. Why? Because we take mainly from the middle class, and we give to the rich. And that doesn't make anybody happy except the rich. In fact, the top 20% in this country are apparently quite happy. So at least we got that covered. The bottom 80% not happy at all, okay? According to, again, the aggregate numbers. So it's not how much the government spends, it's where do they get the money and how do they spend it. So, you know, for example, the United States government collects, uh, you know, has been collecting less and less from the rich. And what do we spend it on? Wars. Well, how has the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war made any of us happier? It hasn't, right? So it's income equality and inequality that is a determinative factor, not how much the government spends. Fascinating study. Uh, and obviously, these are the, if I was president, these are the things that I would care about the most. I'd say, look, if we want a happy, just society, isn't that our ultimate goal? Let's figure out how to get there, and apparently, this is the best correlation we have. Of course, our presidents don't work that way because they're bought by the rich. So they take a look at this study. Oh, that's really interesting. Wow, you say income inequality. Well, my donors say otherwise. So uh, instead, we will lower taxes on the rich. Which brings us to Mitt Romney. Okay. Actually, before we do Mitt Romney, let me do one last thing on Obama. I like what the Progressive Change Campaign Committee is doing. Uh, they're running ads now saying, hey, you know what? Don't do the Georgia Works program. That's what we uh, outlined on yesterday's show, where uh, the unemployed have to work for eight weeks for businesses. Businesses don't have to pay them a damn thing. They continue to collect unemployment, but they have to work. Businesses pay nothing. Taxpayers foot the whole bill. So in essence, it becomes people working for free. And the Progressive Change Campaign Committee is asking, well, how is that progressive? Why is that progressive? You just give a huge gift to the business interests with our tax dollars, and those people don't even have a job, and they don't get paid the regular fees of a job. They just get unemployment. That's a raw deal. That's exactly what we were telling you yesterday. Well, they're doing an ad campaign based on that. So if you go on a lot of websites today, it says, Obama advisor Jason Furman wants you to work for free. Tell him no. They've decided to pick on Jason Furman. Uh, apparently, uh, he, it was his brilliant idea uh, in the first place. But you know me, I think, who's the guy who hired Jason Furman and Tim Geithner and Rahm Emanuel and all the, those guys that uh, Obama has hired. It's Obama. He just happened, whoops, look at that, I hired Jason Furman. No, you hired Jason Furman along with every other conservative Democrat, pro Wall Street Democrat you could possibly find. All right, uh, you know, I partly mentioned this yesterday. Matt Taibbi wrote a funny uh, blog which is going around uh, everywhere, uh, how he says he's not listening to Obama anymore. Like, he, he says, look, I, I, I can't take it. it. Sometimes it makes me ill. Uh, he gets up there and, and he's like, look, the labor speech. I, I knew what he was going to say. He was going to get up there and pretend to be in favor of labor when he hasn't done anything for labor. And that's, that's exactly what happened. And we made fun of that yesterday on the show where he says, oh, I'm from collective bargaining. Get, get, get. And by the way, ex again, we mentioned it briefly yesterday on the program, but today, the White House is running for the hills trying to get away from James Hoffa Jr. Because Hoffa said, let's go get the sons of bitches in the White House. Like, oh my God, my head's going to explode. No, no, no. 
Rush Limbaugh is already criticizing me. Fox News is already criticizing me. By the way, uh, these guys who are so pro-labor, um, they're like, hey, you know, uh, Jay Carney, the spokesperson, said, hey, look, James Hoffa does not speak for the president. He speaks for the AFL-CIO, except apparently the Teamsters are not part of the AFL-CIO. Way to be for labor. Way to check into it. Okay, so now we move on to Romney. Um, don't worry, folks. Mitt Romney has a bold new jobs proposal. And he's going to come to the rescue. I mean, we, we've got 9% unemployment here. And if he's going to be the next president, I want to know his jobs plan. Well, it's a good thing he uh, proposed it and uh, unveiled it yesterday in Nevada, which has the highest uh, problem with unemployment in the country. You want to know what the bold new proposal is? Sit down, sit down. Be, be cool, be cool, because this is shocking. It turns out it's more tax cuts. Oh my God, be still my beating heart. I didn't know that was really more tax cuts from a Republican. I didn't see that coming. And you're going to be shocked to find out who it benefits. It turns out it mainly benefits the rich. Again, I didn't see that coming. But don't worry, that'll trickle down onto your head at some point many decades later, maybe. So here's the proposal. First of all, $6.6 trillion in tax cuts. Because the rich didn't have enough. That's over just 10 years. And these guys say they're going to balance the budget. What a jokester this guy is. How in the world could you balance the budget? By the way, they ask him, they're like, if you do all those tax cuts, your uh, budget isn't close to balanced, and you say you're in favor of a balanced budget amendment. He's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I love answers like, yeah, whatever. Okay, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not balancing the budget. If, I'm, if the Republicans are in charge, of course we're not going to balance the budget. We're, we're going to destroy the budget by giving away more to the rich. By the way, if you add interest, which is what we have to pay, on top of that money for all those tax cuts, because we don't have that money, we have to borrow it to give it to the rich, right? It's $7.8 trillion over 10 years. That's insanity. So let's break it down. Uh, where are these coming from? First of all, he's going to extend all the Bush tax cuts. Of course. Uh, and did you know that 50% uh, of all the benefits of the Bush tax cuts went to just the top 5% of Americans? Okay. So the richest 5% of Americans got half of all of the benefits. So will they do the same under Romney? Of course. In fact, uh, that alone will cost us $4 trillion. Uh, and he says he's going to eliminate ca uh, capital gains taxes for uh, middle-income households. It's a fascinating proposal. He says, no, 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 I I'm for the middle class uh, and the poor. Uh, I'm going to eliminate capital gains for people making under $200,000 and dividends. Well, here's the problem. Almost nobody in that category has capital gains or dividend income. First of all, the poor aren't investing in the stock market, so we're only talking about the middle class. Okay, fine. But it turns out, did you know that uh, capital gains uh, applies 67%, two-thirds of it, more than two-thirds, goes to people making over a million dollars a year. So those capital gains cuts overall and dividend cuts are almost all for the rich. Now, he's saying in this case it's for people under $200,000, but that's why it produces almost no tax. Like, that's the smallest uh, part of his budget by far. It's almost non existent because there's almost nobody under $200,000 who has any decent capital gains and dividend income. There are some people who make some money, but not anything like what the millionaires are making. That's what the real goal is. And by the way, you think he's just going to apply to people making under $200,000? The minute they say yes to that, then he'll say, well, to be fair, we should probably apply it to everybody. And that's when the millionaires get paid. All right. Uh, but that he's not done helping the rich yet. He's also going to eliminate uh, uh, estate taxes. So now you got to understand who the estate tax applies to. It's $5 million an individual. It is not taxed at all upon death. For Per family, it's $10 million, not taxed upon death. OK? And above that number, it's taxed at 35%. So this only applies to for families above leaving an estate above $10 million. Even if you take the individual amount, $5 million. It helps a tiny, tiny sliver of the population, and that sliver is insanely rich. And Mitt Romney gives them another gift. Remember, this was supposed to be a jobs program. What part of this has anything to do with jobs for the middle class? All right, and we're not done yet. One more tax cut. That's a corporate tax cut. And he brings it down from 35% to 25%. 
eliminating a third of all corporate taxes, and that saves uh, the top corporations in the world $900 billion. And then they are theoretically, then out of the goodness of their heart, they might hire people in the United States, although it's much more likely that they'll hire people outside of the country, and they have absolutely no requirement to hire anyone inside the U.S. or to spend any of that money, and that's why they're sitting on nearly $2 trillion already that they are not spending. So there you have it, Mitt Romney's jobs program. <laughs> Hang on, nothing new with jobs. It has everything to do with paying off the rich. So, look, these are the choices that we're dealt with, right? You go with Obama, who's helped the banks, who proposes, you know, significant tax cuts, significant spending cuts, or you go to Romney, which offers you colossal tax cuts for the rich and very little for you, and calls it a jobs program. Now, by the way, this is exactly why Romney is the real Republican candidate backed by all of the moneyed interests. And you can tell in every way, shape, and form. Uh, first of all, again, Karl Rove, talking to George Stephanopoulos, said, oh, uh, Rick Perry, some of his proposals are toxic. So he's not in favor of R Rick Perry. And remember, we told you he put a hatchet in Sarah Palin's back. Okay, so those people are all done. All the money people are saying, Romney, Romney, Romney. Why? Because he's going to give them $7.8 trillion in tax cuts. That's why they're saying Romney. Look, let's look at Palin, right? We brought this up yesterday. Remember, we showed you a clip of Palin saying that, hey, you've got to watch out where the Republican money's coming from. And then I said, oh, they're going to come to get her, right? First, let's show you the clip from yesterday. That's clip number eight. Some GOP candidates, they also raise mammoth amounts of cash, and we need to ask them, too. What, if anything, do their donors expect in return for their investments? We need to know this because our country can't afford more trillion-dollar thank-you notes to campaign backers. I told you, look, that is incredibly grating voice, but at the same time, what she's saying there is actually right. And the Republicans have no interest in that. Now, normally we have an Ann Coulter ban, but I'm going to show you two clips of her on with Laura Ingram, who's subbing in for Bill O'Reilly. And we're not, this isn't about Ann Coulter and her whatever stupid thing she's going to say. It's about Laura Ingram, who is part of the agenda making machine over at Fox News and among the right wing talk show hosts, and how the word is out Sarah Palin is not the person. Watch them rip into her. And Ann, uh, this has been a long tease with Sarah Palin. <laughs> and at some point, that tease, I guess, has got to deliver or just go away. What's going to happen here? Um, maybe not. Newt Gingrich carried it on for about 15 years. And <laughs> I kind of think that might be what we're getting here. Uh, but she's become sort of the Obama of the Tea Party. She's just the one to a certain segment of right wingers. And the tiniest criticism of her, um, I think many of your viewers may not know this, the tiniest. No one, no conservative on TV will criticize Palin because they don't want to deal with the hate mail. Um, you know, you say her voice is a few octaves too high, or perhaps Michelle Bachman's speaking voice is more modulated, and you will be inundated with with enraged well, emails Anne, and letters. All right, I, I love Ann Coulter criticizing Palin's voice. You know, her voice. I know, I know dude. Okay, I know <laughs> what I just said too. Anyway, all right, let's get beyond it. Uh, she just called her Obama. Coulter just called Palin Obama. Look, Coulter's not on that program by accident. Uh, I don't know if you know this, they have producers who plan those shows, and they bring on the guests for a specific purpose. Laura Ingram brought on Ann Coulter to put another hatchet in Palin's back. She's not playing ball, she's gotta go. She's, to even question the idea that the rich would of course get thank you notes and re favors return from Republican candidates, how dare you? That's the whole game, what are you doing? Shut up. So here comes Laura Ingram again. But people, when I talk to them, they seem to be desperate and hungry, more so than ever, for real substance, uh, beyond yes. kind of the sloganeering and the bumper sticker stuff and Obama's driving the country down. She, she had to do more of that heavy lifting on the policy stuff, I think, to be taken seriously. I just simply think she's not all that interested in it. And I like Sarah Palin, but I don't think she seems all that interested in digging really, really deep on that stuff. That's just my sense. No, I agree. And Oh, yeah, they all agree now. All of a sudden, they think Sarah Palin's not substantive. Fascinating how that happened, just like we told you it was going to happen yesterday on the program. 
All right, one last thing on Mitt Romney. You know, he proposes all these insane tax cuts, and that's his so-called jobs proposal. And, of course, the other part of it is that he's going to shred regulations. He's going to get rid of them. Uh, now, one of the things that he says is, well, he says two things. One is uh, that uh, President Obama has greatly expanded federal regulations. That's not really true. But this is what we've been talking about all along. The Republicans come along and go, you see this socialist Obama, look at how much he expanded regulations. When Obama just unveiled a plan to actually get rid of a whole, of dozens, hundreds of regulations, does he get any credit for it? No. That, which could fairly again be characterized as a conservative or a Republican principle, gets redefined as the extreme left. They do the same thing on uh, expanding government. Here's a quote from Romney. The past three years of we, unparalleled we all government expansion have retaught that lesson all too well. That government expansion does not work and stimulus does not work. That's what he's referring to. So now when Obama followed the Republican guidebook, what did he get in return? He got Romney saying, you see that Obama did unparalleled government expansion. So what used to be significantly right-wing, to the right of me when I was a Republican, is now being called the extreme left. Thanks a lot, Obama. We really appreciate it. Way to fight for your own principles, if you have any. And you didn't see this coming. Well, if you didn't see this coming, then you're not a very good politician. And so that is unfortunately exactly as we were worried about. It has now happened. He didn't even fight for our side. And now the Republican ideas he fought for are being called too left. If you, they were going to call you that no matter what, you should have at least fought. But he didn't. It's probably too late. Uh, but we'll talk more about that and handle Rick Perry when we come back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, Susan Jackson is member number 2782. She joined on July 1st of this year. And then let's go to Ciro Amaral, Amaral, uh, 2587, uh, on April 6th of 2011. Ciro, uh, you rock the world. Always reminded of Ciro Rodriguez, who ran for uh, office in Texas, won a couple of times as a Democrat, was an uh, old Young Turks favorite uh, when he used to come on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, uh, we'll have a fun and exciting uh, post-game show filled with surprises today. It'll even surprise us because we're not sure what's in it yet. Okay, next. Researcher from the University of Arizona, Michael Hammer, has discovered that Homo sapiens not only had sex with Neanderthals, they also um, interbred with Homo erectus and Homo <laughs> habilis. <laughs> <laughs> that was a problem in the first place. They were a little Homo erectus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, this uh, is apparently surprising uh, to scientists. It's not surprising to me. Oh, please. Of course. I, I already knew this was going to happen. Look, first of all, I remember reading about the debates on whether Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens had uh, interbred in the first place many years ago. And I thought, eh. end of this. They definitely did. You know why? We're humans. Mm -hmm. We will have sex with anything. Okay. Dave said the exact same thing because I, I, I see Dave as like a scientific type of person. So type of person. He has <laughs> so, a master's degree in science. That, that type of person. Okay. So I wanted to ask him what his thoughts were on this story, and I was like, "Why do you think it happened?" And he's like, "Because they were horny. Like we're we're so similar genetically." Oh, that's one hundred percent right. Close enough. One hundred percent right. Like so, uh, Homo sapiens come out of Africa in Eurasia. They run in Neanderthals. And a guy looks at the Neanderthal chick, and she's a little hairy, and a little scared with that eyebrow thing going on, right? <laughs> on the other hand, there are no other chicks around. <laughs> okay, so I jump in it, okay? And hence, Eastern Europe is born. <laughs> okay, now, I'm gonna get controversial. Now, look, the ridge that the Neanderthals used to have, check out Eastern European dudes. I got a couple of friends. And it's not, look, uh, the percentage of the DNA in Homo sapiens right now that are Neanderthal is tiny. It's one to four percent, right? Which actually is not that tiny, but mm -hmm. so it doesn't have any uh, effect on intelligence or anything like that, right? And the guys I know are really smart, right? But they got the ridge. I mean, that didn't come out of nowhere. Okay, now obviously I'm extrapolating, right? But I knew human nature being what it is. So am I surprised that we also interbred with Homo erectus, et cetera? Of course not. Why did we do it? Because they were there. 
Okay. Right. Look, to this day, there are people in remote areas of the world that are having having at it with farm animals, right? There's Rodell in wherever he was, having taken advantage of horses. Good thing they can't have kids. Do you see what I'm saying? I think that's the most fascinating part, that you're genetically similar enough to not only have sex, but to actually conceive a child and give birth. Oh, no question. I think no that's question. the most fascinating aspect of this story, because, yeah, you know, if, if you look similar enough, am I surprised that a homo sapien would be interested in having sex with homo erectus? No, that doesn't surprise me at all. But it's amazing that they could procreate. Yeah, but again, we weren't that far apart genetically mm -hmm. from those groups, and that's why the whole idea of not believing in evolution is comical. I mean, there's fossil evidence, there's DNA evidence. Now, with the Neanderthals, there's more fossil evidence because cold weather keeps that fo the fossils better. With the Homo erectus, et cetera, there's better DNA evidence, right? But what do you think, like, that the scientists made that up? Or did God also create Homo erectus and want us to copulate with them a couple of times, but not too many times, get a little bit of their DNA inside of us, and then dismiss them? Okay, and by the way, why did we win and those groups largely die out, even with a little bit of their DNA inside of it? One, it's really interesting, because Homo sapiens were more risk takers and they were more curious. So Neanderthals would stay where they were, mm -hmm. right? But if they ran into water, they were done. They weren't gonna go past the water. Homo sapiens are like, I can't see any land on the other side, but fuck it, let's give it a shot. <laughs> okay, and they'd get in the, they'd build the boats, They'd get in the boats and they would sail out. So that's why if you get into the Pacific Islands, et cetera, those are all Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. right? Because only the Homo sapiens went there. And, and, and as a general idea, also, we were vicious. So we were, we're the most vicious animals. So Neanderthal is like, oh, that guy's a Neanderthal. That's our common vision, right? They were chumps compared to us. We ripped their faces off. But first, we fucked. <laughs> okay, and, that, and voila, here we are. And that's why we built these nuclear weapons and can destroy ourselves at any moment. Because we're, we're bright, but we're not that bright. And we're vicious little animals. It's fascinating stuff. I love that story. That was my favorite story of the day. Boom, for sure. there it was. Yep, mm -hmm. totally loved it. All right, uh, next story. A father from Northern Ireland is suing Facebook after his 12-year-old girl put up lewd photos of herself on the website. Now, he's saying, look, you guys don't have safeguards that prevent you know, people under the age of 13 from creating profiles, posting things on their pages. Uh, so because of that lack of oversight, I'm going to go ahead and sue you. Yeah, here's a safeguard. Uh, you, the dad, maybe you should have been watching before your daughter put up racy pictures of herself on Facebook. Now look, sometimes you can and it slipped down. I'm not saying you, like, I, I'm judgmental of him because he wasn't overly vigilant, but I'm not the, the one who brought the lawsuit, he is. So he's telling Facebook, how dare you uh, allow my daughter to put this up when I was taking a nap. But that's your job, isn't it? Yeah, look, this is a really difficult situation because even if he is a good father, it's really difficult to always keep an eye on your 12-year-old, okay? It's, I agree, look, I agree. When I was 12, I was definitely doing some rebellious things that my mom still to this day doesn't know about, and my mom was always in my business, right? Well, that's true, so, and I remember sometimes I didn't even do my math homework on time, or I would eat an extra nutty bar. That's the kind of stuff you were talking about, right? Just calm down, okay? <laughs> okay no, right. but look, and, and the thing is, Facebook does have a responsibility, right? He, Facebook is not the only um, aspect that has a responsibility. The father does have a responsibility as well. But what does Facebook do? Are they now going to start asking for our passport numbers to make sure you're of age to have That's what the dad wants. I don't want that. No, I, think I don't that's want horrible. that either, yeah. They, they get intrude more and more into our lives. Look, Facebook says you cannot post uh, if you're not... It, uh, at least 13 years old. It's a good policy. They try to enforce it as much as they can. I don't want them taking passport numbers to try to enforce it any more than that, right? And look, what do you do if you're a parent? I'm not, again, I'm not judging you, but okay, the kid did it, take it down as soon as you can. Putting the blame on someone else and then trying to get money from them. Uh, no, I'm not buying it, man. You know I'm against those kind of lawsuits. Uh, no way. So. It's not, fa I don't think ultimately it's Facebook's responsibility, it's your responsibility. It's not like Mr. Facebook came out and was like, hey little girl, let's put you in makeup and put pictures on our website. <laughs> Mr. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I guess that'd be Zuckerberg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Facebook. <laughs> okay, Mark Facebook. <laughs> anyway.
<laughs> also, uh, in other lawsuit news today, an Ohio man is suing his coworkers because they will not share their Mega Millions lottery win. So apparently, every week, uh, all of his coworkers would get together and do this lottery pool, right? And while he was out on sick leave, he was out for three months on sick leave, they did the same thing. They bought the lottery tickets, and they won. But when he told them, hey, look, uh, I, I'm your coworker, and there's this unspoken rule that you guys are supposed to give me part of the cash, even if I didn't contribute to that lottery ticket, um, you guys need to give me money, right? Yeah, wrong. Uh, guilty. Or not guilty. <laughs> Whichever one applies. So the guy shouldn't get the money. The coworkers are not guilty. Uh, now, here's my sense of it, right? So apparently there was a couple other guys who decided not to participate in the month that they uh, actually won, and they were like, oh, and they have not sued. And they're right. They didn't participate that month, right? Mm -hmm. But that's obvious, because that was voluntary, right? Uh, and I think... Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum is also easy to decide. If the guy was out that day and he didn't give us five bucks and he, he's been given that five bucks for eight years, no, no, no. He happened to be sick that day. That's crazy. He's part of the winners. No question. You've been out three months, dude. I mean, were you shipping in your five bucks every day, every Hell week no. when you were out? If you were, of course you're part of it, right? But you weren't given the five bucks. Were you going to... When you came back, if you came back, were you guys were, were you gonna say, "Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to give all that money." Here's like you know, 200 bucks for all the the weeks that I missed. You know, you weren't gonna do that, right? So no, you don't get anything. That's it. I've ruled. I agree with this ruling 100%. Now, what I'm curious about is, what would you do as a coworker who did win that lottery money, and then you know, Bob comes back to work, he had like back injury, and he's like, ah, oh, horrible. <laughs> okay, it depends. I mean, if he's really like, oh, 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 oh. and then I say, all right, well, I feel bad for Bob. I mean, Bob's in pretty bad shape. Uh -huh. Maybe we throw a nickel and a dime at the guy. Um, okay. A nickel and a dime, literally. <laughs> okay. All right, so seriously, keep it real. It depends on how much they like the guy. Oh, totally. Right? Totally. And, 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 Look, there are definitely coworkers that you like, and then there are coworkers that you really like. So right. it would also depend the money, the amount of money would depend on how much you like that right. person too. Yeah. Yeah. Now look, we we all get along great here. We're really lucky, right? Mm -hmm. So if Jr. was out for three months in Germany doing whatever he does in Germany, and he came back, and we're like, "Oh, you were out. Oh, what happened, to that big guy? You don't get it." No, we wouldn't do that. You know, uh -huh. we share it. But like, if some intern dude who eats all the cookies <laughs> and comes back three months later, and he's like, "Wait, wait, where's?" my 2.8 million. I'm like, here's where it is, big guy. Okay, here's where it is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if to talk him and run him off. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I'd buy him a basket of cookies. Yeah. That's and if you're nice. going to give the guy anything, it's probably a lesser share. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't give him his, I, I wouldn't give him his share if he were to contribute to that pool, but um, I would give him something if I like the guy. Right. Right. Okay. Are we not merciful? See? See. <laughs> See, we're merciful. Let's do the Kevin Durant story. All right. Uh, Kevin Durant got this tattoo that um, some sports reporters think is awesome. We're going to get so, uh, I'm going to get hate because I don't think it's awesome. But let's. let's okay, show. let's get the hate. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you Don't worry, we're going to share in the hatred because I think it's ridiculous. Uh, he has Maryland tattooed on his back. First of all, this, this is his entire back. Second of all, he's got uh, th like a guy holding three fingers and obviously the five on the other side. 35, that's his jersey number, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, he better not get traded to the Celtics because they've retired the number 35. Otherwise, he's going to have to do another tattoo where they rearrange the fingers. Okay, there's a couple other teams that have retired 35. Uh, and somebody wrote a blog about this. Give him credit. He's the one that came up with that idea. Um, whoever that guy is. Anyway, uh, Maryland? Really? Maryland? Okay, look, if you're from Compton, okay, that's kind of cool to write Compton, right? Not, no, it's not. It's not cool no, to write no, Compton. No, uh, no, you can make an argument. Bronx, that's cool, no, right? No, not, not, it's not cool. It's not cool. It doesn't look nice. It's not attractive. You look, this is my personal opinion. I know there are people out there who love tattoos, and they're like, oh, you're such a bitch. Tattoos are awesome. Uh -huh. But no, but it's not. Especially no. tattoos that are that massive. Right. He, no, it's a turnoff for me if, it's, if a girl has it, right? For a guy, it, look, of course, it's all your personal choice. We're not saying you have to follow us. You're not allowed to get a tattoo because TYT has decided. No, it's just we don't find it appealing, right? But even if you're going to get a tattoo, a massive one that covers your whole back, don't write Maryland. Maryland. 
No, no, no. And it's not Maryland. It's like me writing New Jersey on my hairy back. Huh? New huh? Jersey? You can't write that. That's not cool. What number would you have depicted in fingers? <laughs> I'd have. What is that? 42. Oh, 42. Oh, <laughs> okay. yeah, because you're 42. Yeah, that's what I was in high school. When I was a middle linebacker, not a big deal. <laughs> or I write my hometown, East Brunswick, <laughs> which is the uncoolest name, and would take up, like, would have to go all the way up and down. Now, I'm against the Maryland. J.R. Jackson. I wouldn't do it, but I have no problem with it. I mean, you guys know how I feel about tattoos. I, I think they're fine. Um, and like you're saying, and I know this isn't like a judgment being passed down, I mean, the degree that Anna hates it and you generally hate tattoos, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, it's better. Looks better with the tattoos. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. I of mean, course. It, the, I, the one thing is, is I mean, I feel like tattoos kind of go through, um, they have like generations. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, there was that Jesus that's supposed to be a cool Jesus thing, yeah. and they put father and a heart with a, yeah, yeah. a, a cross in it. Like, that's 1957. Right. It's not tattoos anymore. Just like the tribal around the arm. Everybody who's gotten that has covered it up by now. So if you get something written across your back, like it's your jersey and your name on your back, that's that's 1992, 1993, isn't it? It's kind of, it's just that's oh, the really? part. Oh, really? You think that's already old? School. It's a little dated. Just when you put names across your back. Well, that really sucks that tattoos can be dated. Then why would you get a tattoo? Yeah, here's when it's going to be well, dated in 2045 when he still has it on. <laughs> and people are like, what the hell is in your back? Maryland. And his skin's going to be saggy and stuff. And look, I don't know. I'm obsessed with this. But like some states are cool and some states aren't. Like Dakota. Like, that's cool, right? If you put Dakota, you're from North Dakota, you put Dakota, all right? You put Rhode Island, you're a sh schmuck. Well, he's from D.C., man. He's not going to put District of Columbia. I no, think he's from, I, 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 cool. I assume he's from D.C. He's in Maryland. Where else are you going to put? I don't no, know. No, he must be from Maryland. He can't be from D.C. But like, Otherwise, you'd but put But I'm thinking, like, he's D.C., but, like, he's in, I don't know. I, like, they're all the same thing. Of course, it's its own entity, but I don't know. I mean, he's not from Baltimore, is he? See, Baltimore would be cooler. I mean, it's, you know, messed up, but at least it's a little bit cooler. Well, you could put Ebron, man. Ebron! Oh, I kind of like that, actually. Yeah, 42. <laughs> no, it's a good thing I don't have tattoos. Okay. Uh, all right, I think we're done. We are. Uh, okay, come back for the post game.